Okay. okay. Got it. There we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Tina Monaco of the Georgia Heritage Room at the Augusta Public Library. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael S. Smith about his recently published book, The Lost Freedmen's Town of Hamburg, South Carolina. Uh, the book explores the history of Hamburg from its founding as a center of commerce and trade by Henry Schultz to a freedman's town after the Civil War and finally to its tragic demise following the Hamburg Massacre. Uh, Smith also delves into the current controversy surrounding the Meriwether Monument in North Augusta and the ongoing protests calling for its removal. Michael S. Smith is an award-winning South Carolina journalist. He has worked for nearly 20 years as a reporter and editor for several South Carolina publications and has spent the past three and a half years working as a technical writer. Born and raised in Albany, New York, Michael moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to attend Coastal Carolina University. A history major, Smith developed a passion for historical research and in-depth writing. He graduated in 1999 with a bachelor's degree in secondary education and history. In August 2000, Smith entered the newspaper profession. From 2003 to 2016, he was editor with Waccamaw Publishers in Conway, South Carolina, where he won dozens of state press awards, including South Carolina Journalist of the Year twice. Smith was executive editor of the Aiken Standard and North Carolina, or sorry, North Augusta Star from 2016 through 2017. Under his leadership, the newspaper won several dozen state press awards. Smith is married to his wife, Nicole Pioli. Together, they reside in Aiken, South Carolina and own a horse, three dogs, two mini donkeys and a cat. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. And I have to ask, do the donkeys have names and what are they? They do. They do. They're pancake and waffles. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to dive right in with questions about Michael's book. Um, and first, we're going to uh, discuss Henry Schultz, who, of course, was the founder of Hamburg, South Carolina. And he's sort of a larger than life figure in local history. And in the book, Michael, you discuss a bit of Schultz's backstory and how he ended up in Augusta. Will you give us a brief outline of who Henry Schultz was? Sure, sure. Um, there's really two accounts. Um, uh, the um, more popular, though maybe slight you know, embellishment in some of the newspapers of the 50s and 60s has him being a, um, a vet, someone who had fought in the Napoleonic Wars, um, that he was captured not once but twice by Napoleon's forces and that uh, Napoleon took pity on him because he was so young and uh, rather than face execution, uh, he uh, freed or pardoned um, Mr. Schultz and said, with the promise that he'd never take arms up against France again, yet again, ever again. Right. Um, and you know, it, there, there's no proof that that did happen or didn't happen. However, there's another account that's a little bit less uh, exciting. Um, and I have to read this because I'm not German, but uh, Klaus Henrik Klein is the name given to um, a man that many believe to also have been um, Henry Schultz and that he just mainly came to America looking to make money. I, I suspect the truth is somewhere in between, but um, because the Aiken newspapers of the 40s, 50s and 60s love the Napoleon story so much, um, I'd, ha I'd hate to throw cold water on that completely without proof. <laughs> so that's the one that that sort of um, gained traction was the Napoleonic story. It is. It's a much more okay. colorful account. Yeah, certainly. it is. <laughs> it got my attention. Mine too. Um, <laughs> so Hamburg was built between 1821 and 1826 and was a commercial success from its beginning. In the book, you state that for a brief period, Antebellum ha Hamburg rivaled Augusta. At the peak of its success, the town was essentially piled high with trade goods from all over South Carolina and other Southern states. Can you talk about this success and about the town itself, its size, layout, geography, what made it an ideal spot um, as a trade center? And also um, that sort of geography ultimately led to its future failure because it was sort of swampy and prone to flooding. Right, right. And there's a lot to unpack there, but yeah. the, uh, the short uh, the short of it <laughs> is, is that, of course, that Henry Schultz knew the rivers and um, he spent many years um, when he didn't have a lot of money here in America applying the rivers. He knew which directions 
the currents flowed in and he knew the best way to navigate the river. See the river and obviously in the 1800s and early 1800s didn't have all the dams and all the, 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 the high tech controls that we have today. It was a very right. dangerous thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it was flooding back in the 18th century. Um, yeah. And he just, um, he, he knew how to navigate the rivers and he put that knowledge to good use by, um, uh, you know, having steamship uh, industry grow rapidly. It, and it was really the only uh, economical and the quickest way at, at the time to, to get to Hamburg uh, just by navigating the rivers from Savannah and back and forth. And uh, uh, it was a great way to cut off Augusta because Augusta side was a little bit rougher and uh, the, the South Carolina side, you know, really lent itself well to, to Hamburg. As for the flooding, yeah, it was built in a, on a lowland area, but uh, the record just shows that every time there was a flood, about it was about an every 10 year event, they would just rebuild. And right. um, at the time they had the resources, but, uh, uh, and the trade was rising exponentially. People were camping outside of town, miles outside of town just to get in. And when you did, I mean, you, it was like trying to cross uh, uh, Fifth Avenue in New York City, almost, I mean, maybe not quite like that, but you, know, you had to watch your step because there was traffic going back and forth constantly. It was Yeah, it was, it was really booming. Uh, and I never had heard that, that people were camping for miles outside of town just trying to get mm -hmm. in. So that's interesting. Um, Hamburg also, and I didn't know this either, Hamburg had its own newspaper, the Hamburg Gazette, as right. well as other publications over the years. Um, are there existing copies of these newspapers and where are they located? Right. Um, well, the best source, um, and well, my dog ate part of it, but um, <laughs> it's simply called South Carolina Newspapers by uh -huh. John Hammond Moore. Um, right. They actually sell copies uh, in Columbia at USC. I have a copy. That's the one that I well, still have most, most of it. We about, actually but. have it here in the Georgia room. We have a copy oh, of that. Wow. Could have saved yeah. me I wish I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, it, it's an excellent book because it talks about every newspaper that published in every county and it also has a description of where to find them. Now, most of them, the Carolinian Library has, mm -hmm. but some of them they don't. And the Hamburg Gazette was one that didn't. And it, I was fascinated by this one because it predated everything that uh, I had seen and heard right. um, in the area. So I said, I have to have copies. Um, you have to buy them through the American Antiquarian Society up in Massachusetts. Okay. And, took a little I mean they were just they were they were great people it just um they were going through a, a renovation at the time so it took I was I was antsy I wanted that paper yeah because it took even the little things just like how much something cost they would publish in the corner bottom corner of the newspaper most of it was poetry and fiction stories but every now and then they give you little glimpses into Hamburg including names of ships that were due to arrive and uh it just, it, it was, it was really cool just to have a copy. And um, I ordered two, there's two others, but I got the two first, the earliest editions. So was there more national reporting or was it specific to Hamburg? Or it was most kind of a mix. Of, it was a mix. Um, it was just a four page paper, mostly mm -hmm. national reporting. There was even some poetry sometimes would find its way in there, but there would be about um, the equivalent of a page or so of, um, uh, local news it was it was okay. scattered it wasn't nearly as organized as it was today and you have to right. have good vision and transcription skills but uh, sure. <laughs> but it was excellent and, and and so i've got i have copies i've saved and uh you know, I'll, I'll never let them go <laughs> you should bring them down to the georgia room sometime so we can take a look at them sure I'm happy really to i've got jpegs of all of them so okay um Around 1827, the Savannah, River's le Savannah River levels dropped, threatening inland navigation and trade routes, and also trade between Hamburg and Charleston dro dropped off at this time. Um, so in comes the railroad um, after this to kind of solve logistical problems. At the time, however, locomotives weren't capable of the steep incline between Aiken and Hamburg, but engineers came up with an ingenious solution, the inclined plane. Can you tell us about this and how Aiken came into being because of this technical technological innovation? And also maybe touch on the plank road craze of the 1850s and how this impacted Hamburg. Oh, certainly. And uh, I'll try to tackle all that too. Um, the, um, the, <laughs> no, it's Sorry, a lot, these but, are a lot of no, questions. That's quite right. <laughs> it's quite all right. It's, uh, I love it. I love it. Um, the, um, well, start with the uh, incline plane. Um, even today, like if you're starting Aiken, hop in the car, drive down Jefferson Davis Highway, it, you know, it's up and down, but it's mostly down. And when you're yeah. coming back to Aiken, you're going mostly uphill. 
Right. And, you know, we don't think about it because our cars have a lot of power to them. But uh, these trains, I mean, they were the initial trains couldn't make 20. Um, and, and on top of that, they didn't have the best braking mechanisms like you'd have today. That thing would just run out of control if you just ran a straight line down the hill. Right. Um, and so um, they navig- some of this they were able to do by do- making a kind of a sign winder, but they had to do the incline plane for some of the steeper grades where anyone who's been to Pittsburgh, they have an, an incline plane. Now, and that one takes only about 20 minutes to load and get up the hill to go take a look at the cityscape. Uh, back in the 1820s, you're looking at several hours to a day. And, right. and on top of that, it would it, it didn't take long for there to be a backlog. Um, and so people had to stay overnight somewhere. And it was a long trek. You know, we uh, I jokingly at, at the time, it probably took six to nine hours to get from Charleston to Hamburg. And I joked mm-hmm. it today. It probably takes about that long once you get to Charleston. Because the traffic. The traffic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but at the time, you know, it, there was a, it was a, it was just a long, boring trip. Um, there was nothing to hold the sites. And uh, when you got to Aiken, there was a log jam. So people needed a place to stay. And it gave birth to uh, this, this, the city of Aiken because, yeah. um, and then of course, we all know the, 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 the tales of how, that's, that, how that city evolved and the railroad's mm-hmm. uh, impact on it. And, uh, but it just fascinated me that, geez, you know, if it wasn't for this railroad and if it wasn't for Hamburg, because Hamburg was why they built the railroad, there would be no Aiken. No, okay, yeah, and I, I didn't know that either. So that, that's an interesting bit of uh, history about Aiken that I don't mm-hmm. know that too many people know how it came into being. And then the Plank Road craze. Yes, yes, that was <laughs> that was the monorail of the 1850s. And, you know, I'm, I, I swear I'm not trying to pick on the city of North Augusta for this, but they still have on their website that Henry Schultz is one of his greatest accomplishments is to build these Plank Roads and it connected North Augusta to Edgefield. Well... The Plank Road craze actually began right about when Henry Schultz died. Right. So he wasn't even alive. And uh, and for reasons I, I guess I can get to a little bit later, he wouldn't have liked it anyways. Um, he was all about the rivers. He hated the railroad. I mean, he thought that it was just the worst thing. It would ruin Hamburg. And I guess in a way he was right, but not for the ways he was portraying. Yeah. It, it was competition. It, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it did... Hamburg profited because of the railroad and initially. I always initially and I always wondered why Henry Schultz was reluctant to embrace it and you sort of go over that in exactly. the book as well yeah and in the end he proved right because um then now Augusta there's a way to get to Augusta and and boy that just must have gotten him seething uh just the idea that trade with Augusta was made easier by the railroad he he, he just didn't want any part of that so it would bypass a lot of what he was doing I think he probably recognized some of that do you do you want to talk a little bit about his just his aunt hatred for Augusta and and where that stent what where that well, came from what it was rooted in? Well, that goes all the way back to a failed bridge project mm-hmm. that he um, had back in the uh, 18, 19, 18, 18, 19 time frame right before the founding of Augusta, and I think the blame with that probably rested more with. Uh, his business partners having financial troubles, but um, you know, why blame them when you can blame Augusta, you know, the big Goliath, Dave, I'm David, David slaying slaying Goliath. Yeah. And, and he, and, and and I think Augusta had some, you know, there was some issues he had with the banks there and he just blamed them and thought they were out to get him. Um, And uh, he was very, very much a populist (laughs) for Mm -hmm. his time period. And, and so um, he just, and it just continued. And then, you know, I'm sure, you know, obviously Augusta took notice. There was issues over tolls. They -hmm. went to, you know, that the bridge fight lasted decades. Uh, He litigated it all the way to the Supreme court of South Carolina, lost every step of the way. Um, Every, he, you know, for a while he was the equivalent of a millionaire, but he just burned it all away on legal bills because yes. he just couldn't let it go. He seemed like it, it was his hatred of Augusta that ended up bankrupting him in the end. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's an early death knell for Hamburg itself because one thing he did, even though he was broke, people still listened to him and he mm-hmm. would just advocate for Hamburg. He could, he could go to Columbia and make a speech and people would listen to it. And um, when he was gone, you know, you know, well, I won't, I don't want to time hop too much, but there, there was no successor. <laughs> no, it's true. It kind of floundered after mm-hmm. um, Schultz. Uh, so having said that, we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit sure. and um, talk about the mass- the Hamburg Massacre. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Hamburg Massacre didn't happen in a vacuum. And you do an excellent job of sort of setting the stage for the reader by describing the 
uh, reconstruction atmosphere in the area, the hostility building among whites towards blacks, uh, mm -hmm. the Ned Tenet riots, uh, the lynching of six blacks in Edgefield following the double murder of John Harmon and his wife, Catherine, and then the rise of the white rifle clubs, which were a precursor to the, mm -hmm. of the KKK, of course. Um, can you sort of describe this atmosphere for us? Sure, sure. I mean, all of those things obviously uh, were part of the part of the stew, if you will, um, mm -hmm. that, that was building. There were also some other um, militias, uh, right. African American militias that had formed smaller militias. But I believe there was one in the Ridge Spring Mineta area. Um, there were some in Edgefield and and even over in um, um, down down as far down as Waynesboro, Georgia. I mean, and and. The, the whites who had just lost, you know, from the Civil War were already burned by that. They were burned by Reconstruction. Their, 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 their home was occupied by uh, Northern uh, Reconstruction peacekeeping troops. And then to see African-Americans um, take up arms and form their own militia, it was just pouring salt on, or pouring up salt on an open wound. I mean, they were just, they were just burned by this. So some of these um, resulted in little clashes between what you'd call it precursors, some of these paramilitary groups. There were some whites um, that banded together. General Matthew Butler, MC Butler, was uh, at the forefront of a lot of that. Um, along the way, his home got burned. Um, Ned Tennant, who led the two Ned Tennant riots, he, he, you know, they were out to get him too. <laughs> and, and there was probably truth that it, both sides probably you know, burned each other's homes, but uh, there was never any proof. But um, I guess in that time, you didn't need proof. And uh, uh, miraculously, we didn't have a, a Hamburg-like massacre then, but um, mm -hmm. they were a little a quell. But it all just boiled over um, when um, you know the days leading up to the Hamburg massacre, right before the Fourth of July, and uh, uh, when when two men, young men, uh, <laughs> who who were not uh, who were I would not call them a radical Republicans by any means. They were they were true Southern Democrats. Um, and Thomas Butler and Henry Getson, when they saw an African American uh, drilling in the street, uh, I, I think that right there kind of, you know, the, the fuse was about to be lit. And, uh, okay. you know, there's, there's so many things. And like you mentioned the double murder in Edgefield, the race, you know, that, was, that was just a couple of months before the Hamburg massacre um, and, and the paramilitary groups that were the red shirts that came along. It was, it was, uh, it, it was inevitable. Yeah. Um some of the key players in the Hamburg massacre were Doc Adams, Alan Attaway, Thomas Butler, his father, Robert Butler, uh, Henry Getson, who you mentioned, and Prince Rivers. Um, can you discuss a few of these men and the events in Hamburg that led up to the massacre? Sure, on sure. That day? Um, of course, um, Henry Getson and Thomas Butler were half brothers uh, who were riding together in a buggy on their way back from Augusta and the only way home, uh, as you can imagine, it'd be almost like akin to riding up Georgia Avenue after crossing the bridge. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and cause the, the Butler home is literally at the top of that hill and, right. um, and it's still the there. Star of Edgefield. The star of Edgefield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, so to imagine, you know, a dirt road at the time with old, a lot older buildings and seeing, um, you know, several dozen African-Americans drilling in the streets, you know, to them, they probably, at first they thought they kind of smirked and laughed, but then it just kind of, as they you know, watch just go on and on, they just, you know, couldn't stand it anymore. And, uh, you know, they were going to say something about it. Uh, Robert Butler, you know, after the confrontation, it, it, it got, I think it, it started to rain, I believe, it, it, as they were about to maybe come to blows. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc Adams was the captain of that militia, and he was, you um, something of a hothead, not much as Alan Attaway, which I'll get to in a minute, but he, he I think he probably shot his mouth off a little bit, um, which is probably not the best thing to do at the time. But however, you know, they were in the right. I mean, there was no reason why they couldn't drill in the streets. And sure. the demand that they part just because they're, they were black and because two white men were wanting to go through, that was, but it was a sign of the times. And um, so, uh, but anyways, Robert Butler heard about this. He was steamed. And so he reaches out, gets General Matthew and C. Butler to come help uh, prosecute the case because he files charges against Doc Adams. Um, Prince Rivers is the magistrate of the town who actually fought uh, and was a, uh, one of the most prominent African-Americans to fight in, in the uh, Civil War. 
Um, so he, he had, he was a, a name of significance, um, but, uh, um, but the fact that he held the, the position of magistrate and had been on town council, you know, he had his own controversies in the years leading up. Nothing he did. Mm-hmm. They're just whites stirring up trouble, yeah. trying to smear his name. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Alan Attaway, he just was part of the militia. I think he was second lieutenant and he was mm-hmm. a county councilman at the time. And he was a loud mouth. Even, even his staunchest allies said, you know, they tried to be nice and said, well, he's spirited, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, he, he really shot his mouth off. And I think he let the new power go to his head. And then when he realized, oh, <laughs> you know, then he, you know, he came to a coming at the end there. But uh, uh, so that's a brief uh, synopsis, I think, of all the characters. There's more, obviously, but uh, um, but they, they all came together under one roof in court and um, uh, it, it got heated. Prince Rivers uh, adjourned for the day. Um, and then instead of uh, coming back two days later, uh, that's when uh, all of the different paramilitary white, you know, white paramilitary folks came pouring into town, half of them were drinking all day. And um, so you can imagine what, uh, you know, what was getting ready to happen. <laughs> right. Um, so you, and you give a very deca- de- detailed account of what happened on the actual day um, mm-hmm. on July 8th, 1876 of the massacre. Um, do you want to just discuss it any further, or maybe um, we can talk about what occurred in its aftermath when the sure. U.S. Senate appointed the South Carolina mm-hmm. Committee to investigate the Hamburg massacre, right. as right. well as the Ellington riots. Okay, well, I definitely don't want to spoil the, the, yeah. the story of the because of the, I I tried to tell the massacre as a story. Yeah, almost like a movie, like you're mm-hmm. there, as opposed to just this happened on this date and this happened then and this is sure. what happened. Um, but, uh, the big thing that really set everything off, there was a, you know, obviously there was a, you know, gunfire that happened and nobody knows who fired the first shots, the African-Americans, uh, militia and other assorted people who just took shelter in the, um, in the drill room that they had, the ammunition room where it was a two-story structure, which was pretty sturdy. And, uh, um, and then the, of course the whites amassed outside and, and the geography of the area is such that they were kind of pinned against the river a little bit, but there were also people along the banks of the river too. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the, there was a one side facing away from everything that they were able to escape from the second floor, but that's a, that's, I'll say that for the book, but yeah, one bullet <clears throat> uh, happened to strike and it's unclear who fired the bullet. If it was friendly fire ricocheting or if it was from the, one of the militia men, but uh, uh, struck a man named Thomas Mackey Merriweather and um right in the head and it was pretty grisly and it was just shocking because he had been shooting his mouth up all day about what he was going to do yeah and he didn't make it but um you know a few minutes into the massacre um of course it leads to the monument which i'm sure we'll talk about the merryweather mm-hmm. monument in a little bit but um but that just really stoked i mean if, if, the, if the whites weren't ready for a fight then that just gave them all the cannon fodder even ben tillman later said that that, that the killing of merryweather just was really, the catalyst it was it galvanized everybody and mm-hmm. um um you know so basically those that didn't escape were brought back into what they called a dead ring basically a bunch of people surrounding them so they couldn't escape and one by one people were called uh by name and executed uh one person got away he, he just took off and running he got shot but he didn't make it out of there uh he later testified on the committee yeah. um, a, a few days later there was a committee assembled three people Two, Democrat, or two Republicans and one Democrat. The one Democrat was out of Asheville, um, uh, Senator Merriman. Merriman he, was yeah. kind of a, he was not a nice guy. He would be equivalent to, well, I won't get into low, to current politics, but he would, he'd be, he was an extremist for sure. And, okay. um, and the other two were Republicans. One was trying to retire and couldn't, and the other was just trying to do his duty. But they did a thorough job. Nothing resulted of this. They interviewed uh, dozens of people um, there's so many people I couldn't even include it all in the book. I mean, it lends itself to, and you can use it. Maybe one day I'll write a book about Ellington, mm-hmm. riot, which happened a couple months later and was much mm-hmm. more bloody. Right. But, um, the, um, but it, it did, they did produce, uh, about 1500 pages or more of, of firsthand accounts, you know, and you can read into what you believe is true or not true, but it's part of the public record. So, for, where is it where is the account um it, it's actually um accessible online um, okay. i'm trying to remember where um but i think i pulled mine just just you know from a you know google books it's considered okay. part of the public domain but okay. uh, all three volumes are um in ex- excruciating detail i would okay, say excruciating yeah. it's just very painstaking yeah and, 
Um, and, and the transcripts speak for themselves. It's amazing the glimpse that uh, they give into it. Like real quick, there's an interesting anecdote that didn't make it into the book. They interviewed um, one of the police chiefs in Augusta um, mm -hmm. about how the heck could that cannon gotten wheeled over because it can't you know, the whites wheeled over a cannon across the bridge and he just he was almost flippant about his answers i don't know it, it, geez it's a, I, i'm as stumped as you are <laughs> i'm paraphrasing of course right. but um he knew how that cannon got out of it was locked up in an armory in in, in in augusta and somehow it magically got wheeled out across the river uh <laughs> so it was amazing to read because I, I was i almost laughed when i read it because but I couldn't figure out a way to make it part of the book because, you know, he was, it was an interesting, it's just so many facets of this thing that. Uh, it could uh, be their own story. Yeah, a Especially sequel. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it speaks to the indifference that, of the time period. Yes. To injustices. And then, um, so now we'll move on to the Meriwether Monument and, the, and you discussed that in the last chapter. Um, and then the recent protests to bring it down and the controversy surrounding it in terms of mm -hmm. the inscription that it honors um, a man, Meriwether, whose sole purpose of the day was to kill as many African-Americans as he could, but it doesn't name the seven black men who were brutally murdered. Will you discuss the monument and why you believe it still stands? Right, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> tough, always a tough question. Um, I think that the current city council has the best of intentions. I think they want to listen. Uh, in my experience in covering local governments, I, I've worked in, in Horry County, Georgetown, Richland, Fairfield, um, Aiken, Edgefield, you, you name it, half the counties in the state, I probably sat at a council meeting. The one thing they want, they just want things to be nice. They want things to run smooth. They don't want controversy. They definitely don't want litigation. Um, even though technically the monument is, see, most monuments in South Carolina fall under the South Carolina Heritage Act. Mm -hmm. uh, but what makes the Meriwether Monument unique, and the South Carolina Attorney General even states this in his opinion, uh, there was no war. That, that this is, I mean, it stems from feelings from left over from the Civil War, but there was no war associated with it. The Hamburg Massacre was not a military battle. Right. Um, and so it probably wouldn't fall under the Heritage Act. However, that's just an opinion. Anybody can file a lawsuit if they want to. And if North Augusta, you know, said, okay, we're going to tear that monument down, kind of like how Charleston did with the Calhoun statue. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody would probably file a lawsuit. I, I, there was a, I put this, this is in my book. There's a gentleman, I didn't name him because he, you know, he, he, he came to city council. He's a private citizen, but I couldn't believe the misinformation I was hearing. He said, made the allegation that Thomas Mackey Merriweather took arms in support and defense of the African-American militia. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that came from, but there are people that just believe certain things. You know, we, you know, we see it today with COVID. We see it today with, uh, you know, other items in the national news. And, uh, you know, you could ridicule, you can do this. Join the meeting. All you can do is just print and record facts. And that's what I try to do. And, uh, um, but, um, as for the Meriwether Monument, um, I actually don't believe it should be taken down. I just believe that there should be something more substantive done to honor the um, African Americans. And while doing a, a, you know, doing some kind of a contextual marker on the site is a, a step in the right direction. It, it seems like a peace offering to me. Um, yeah. The city of North Augusta, I'm fascinated that they own uh, land that they paid a hundred grand to acquire that is occupies the rest of undeveloped Hamburg and they've mm -hmm. just been sitting on it uh, <laughs> with, so they could do something down there pretty inexpensively. Um, there's talk of maybe a Prince Rivers bust, which would be pretty cool to yeah, have it would be. Uh, and some of these others, but um, you know, it, it, the monument is there. You're not going to tear it down and, you know, you, you're going to have another half the population just as angry as the half that's angry that it's up there. And I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but um, you know, it's a, uh, you know, the pyramids were built by slaves. So we're going to tear those down. It, 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 how far do you go with it? But at the same time, there's a definite injustice there and not, uh, I'll close with this. Henry Getson you know, gets a pond and he was probably the most violent oh, of yeah. the, he, he directly is responsible uh, for shooting at least two of the, the victims, maybe more mm -hmm. during the massacre, but he gets to be a judge. He gets to run the town. 
Uh, he gets his own pond that people, I mean, I list, I watch videos that local media put up Getson's and they can talk pond. about Getson Pond mm-hmm. is like this wonderful, reminiscing, great thing. And I'm sure it was a fun place to swim, but um, it, you know, the people were having pool parties where, you know, and African-Americans were slaughtered. Yeah, <laughs> it just absolutely. doesn't, the, the two, I can't reconcile those two things. <laughs> no, I can't either. Um, so my last question is, you know, is there anything else you'd like to add about the book or the story of Hamburg in closing? Sure. Just that I wish that, well, I obviously I had to publish at some point, but um, things really started developing. Um, I want, I want it last year with the, with all the different race riots and uh, uh, the racial tensions that were boiling, I was able to get some of that into the book. And then mm-hmm. the insurrection happened on January the 6th, which I mean, they're a little bit different than the Hamburg massacre, but not much. You, you had a, it, it, a big part of the Hamburg massacre, aside from the racial tensions, was just was political. Mm-hmm. You had people who just loathed the radical Republicans, and uh, they were they were despised as much as African Americans were. It, right. it didn't matter if you were white, if you were a ra- radical Republican, you were corrupt, and you had to go. And um, and and a lot of this violence was designed to you know have voter intimidation and keep African-Americans away from the polls who tended, who voted Democratic, or I'm sorry, who voted um, Republican at the time, Democratic mm-hmm. today. And um, it, 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 it was all a political to keep, you know, now granted the, the, the insurrection was a little bit different. That was a, against the certification of the new president, but still um, it just goes to show how misinformation and populism can fuel people to just do some crazy things. And we had violence on the Capitol. Uh, in the name of uh, political gain. And right. um, I, I wish I had more time to explore that, that theme, but obviously I, you know, I, I, I was already months in with the publisher and we were doing the final touches on the editing process. So leaves time for another book. Another and, uh, book, and I, yeah. And I mentioned Ellington, just a real quick thing on Ellington, you know, yeah, had dozens of people killed in that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, it's, it's mostly part of the Savannah River site uh, mm-hmm. is built on top of it. But, um, uh, and, and it's funny how, folks like Henry Getson and, and Thomas Butler, especially Henry Getson, who, you know, oh, it wasn't our fault. We were defending ourselves. But then they found themselves magically down in Ellington, which at the time was probably, you know, took at least an hour or two to get on air on mm-hmm. horseback. Um, you know, I'm sure they weren't just defending themselves uh, in, in that incident. <laughs> no, not at all. Anyhow, so uh, much to say, so much to explore. <laughs> it is. But, the, you know, so if, if our um, viewers are interested, they can read your book. Uh, we have copies here at the Augusta Public Library available for checkout. Uh, if our viewers would like to purchase the book, where could they do that? Where is it being sold locally? Right. Well, online? Um, it, online, of course, all, mm-hmm. all the major book retailers have it. Um, and you can also get it downtown. The Aiken Antique Mall is a popular and place. Uh, this is the book for our viewers to see. Yep. Mm-hmm. The lost free man's town of Hamburg, South Carolina. That was the, the publisher. We had to distinguish it somehow from Hamburg, Germany, even mm-hmm. though that has a say. But uh, plays a part in the naming it, of it, though. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, um, in fact, I, I don't. I wish I had that directly in front of me. But uh, but a lot of the independent bookstores uh, in the Aiken Augusta area have it uh, as well. Okay. Um, but, Book um, Tavern in downtown Augusta, I'm yes. sure has it. Okay. So, but uh, online, the major book retailers, you can get it from Target, you can get it from Barnes and Noble, um, Amazon, you know, okay. all, all the major, anywhere you would expect to have it, you can find it, just enter in the name of the book and there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, so that concludes our book talk. Thank you, Michael, and congratulations on the book. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you to our viewers. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about programming here at the Augusta Public Library, visit our website at www.arcpls.org. Thank you.